it's Roar badgering the the owner of the the gun company, the manufacturer, yeah, and getting the cross him on him, yeah, and getting him to blurt, you know, what did he what did he say something like, I I stand on the second amendment, beep, you know, um, kind of yes. like that, uh, what is that? A few good men, I ordered the code red moment. So in my notes on best witness moment, the Colonel Jessup Award. Yeah. <laughs> I have that CEO with his Second Amendment declaration as his code red moment. Yes. So we are on the same wavelength for that. Today's Movie Verdicts episode of Lone Star Lawyers on the Varsity Podcast Network is brought to you by Varsity Search. Varsity Search builds great teams by connecting lawyers in Texas with career opportunities at small and boutique law firms. Also in jury consulting, where we hear there's a hole in the market where Rankin Fitch used to be. <laughs> so if you're thinking of making a move or your law firm's looking to hire, please go to varsitysearch.com and book a time to visit right into my calendar. Varsity Search, building great teams. Gentlemen, trials are too important to be left up to juries. It's time for Runaway Jury. To guarantee their verdict, they hired an expert from the outside. Find something on every one of them. But the one thing they didn't predict was someone on the inside. The jury's mine, and I can push it either way. For a price. From the best-selling thriller by John Grisham, John Cusack, Gene Hackman. I want you to find her. Dustin Hoffman. I know you're playing both sides. Rachel Weiss. Anyone can be gotten to. You're losing me, my jury! Runaway Jury, directed by Gary Fleeter. Welcome, everybody, back to Movie Verdicts. Hey, hey. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm excited to be back. Robert Callahan's with us. Uh, Baylor Law School's finest. Thank you. You got to say it correctly. I And I think I got it now. Uh, I, hope, right. I have to, like, you know, make, make, make sure I got that right. But I think I got it each time now. <laughs> We're in good shape. Uh, and the man who's never run a marathon, but he hosts a runaway jury. It's Daniel Hare. <laughs> See, you needed to do more research. I've won four marathons. Oh, snap. Uh, oh, <laughs> you're, you're short me four. <laughs> that's four more than I've, that's five more than I've ever done. Uh, I can say with confidence, I'll never do one. <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, you did a great lead in to our movie today. Runaway Jury, uh, and I'm excited about this uh, because uh, it, it's interesting. I feel like that this is the first of what I assume will be several, if not many, uh, John Grisham legal thriller movies, which from like 1992 to like about 2006 uh, were probably some of the best legal movies, novels and legal movies uh, that were going on. Um, and so, but, uh, it, I think, uh, this is a good one to start with. It's, uh, it's, as we'll get into it, it's not, I don't think the most popular or the most known, uh, but, uh, at the same time, I, I think it's a really good movie and watching it back. It'd been a while since I'd seen it. And, um, Robert, when you watched it back, um, what, and not, not to get into like the major themes yet or anything, but just kind of, uh, as you watched it back, what, what were a couple of the things that struck you about it um having i'm sure not seen it in a while you know uh first of all i completely forgot that this was a john grisham adaptation oh yeah so that was a reminder when i when i started watching it um you know i remember it feeling a little bit jumpier i think i might have even seen this in the movie theater john cusack was a great actor i, I love him i love joan C cusack yeah 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 um, I, I think that I just forgot how well written the, the script and the, the, the direction everything was. Yeah. And yeah. oh, and, and New Orleans. Can't well, New and so Orleans. that's, I mean, you, you get that with the John Grisham style, right? You get, I mean, he is as Southern as it gets in terms of the culture and bringing that into his stories. I mean, in really all of them, in some way, shape, when you think about the firm in Memphis, you think about the Pelican Brief also in New Orleans, you think about 
um, uh, a time to kill. I mean, all the ones that we'll do at some point. Say it right, New Orleans. <laughs> New Orleans, New Orleans, one word. And the one South, word. That's right. Is a big part, and not only like so. So what I and we could talk more about this, but I think what I appreciated about it, and I, I made a couple of notes about it as as I was going through, is um, you know that not not is it that it's just set in those cities or in that region or whatever, mm-hmm. but that there are intentional places where. And I think if you read the novels, both there and then the way they do the movies too, where that culture is being highlighted and yeah. and and making sure that it's sort of part of the, you know, it's almost like mm-hmm. another character in some ways. Yeah. Um, to the show, I mean, like I'm thinking about like in this, like the the rail car where uh, Fitch and um, Marley have their meeting, mm-hmm. um, you know, and uh, just things like that where and the chase scene after. Um, uh, Doyle breaks into Nick Easter's apartment and then there's mm-hmm. a chase through New Orleans, basically. And you mm-hmm. kind of see just all these bits and pieces um, where you hear that, that you know, the saxophone player on the street mm-hmm. and just kind of they, you know, just that stuff where they really make uh, New Orleans, New Orleans, a, uh, <laughs> you know, a uh, another character. Yeah, uh, in the movie, and I I love that. It's not your campy. Hey, look, we're we're in New Orleans, and there's there's Creole food here, and there's Zydeco music in the background. It's like you're really authentically there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't know. Uh, actually, the first time through, I didn't notice it, but I noted it the the second time through. Uh, in fact, it, it starts at the very, very beginning. And, and this is sort of a little, uh, I think, just sort of movie intro trope that people use. And and I think sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I usually like it. But where someone's driving in the car, this time it's the, uh, the uh, victim of the gun shooting. And you're just hearing the morning drive guy. Mm. Good morning. It's Rob Ryan with you. Coming up, tickets for the big voodoo fest coming to town. To train to the banks of the Mississippi from Baton Rouge to Bayou Boutique. This is Hooks checking your news headlines. Good day to be in New Orleans. On the radio. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, it's, you know, whatever his name is, um, you know, on the radio. And he tells you it's a beautiful morning in New Orleans and it's mm-hmm. whatever time. And the weather's like, it just sets the picture and the scene. And you kind of get a sense of this is supposed to be a normal day. Uh, mm-hmm. A beautiful day here in the city, and it again just sort of brings up right off the bat um, yeah. how important the city is going to be, and that it's supposed to just be a normal day before everything goes haywire. Obviously, um, uh, in the victim's life, um, mm-hmm. which priests predates the the obviously the most of the movie, which is the case. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I, I, I love all of that um, for sure. Well, this was you? made in two thousand three. Oh, go ahead, sorry. No, what about you? What, what are some things that you going back and looking at it? What did you notice? Uh, so aside from what I just mentioned, uh, something else that, especially like at the top of the movie that just felt, um, quaint a little slash dated is seeing the home movies of the victim played multiple times Mm. because you just don't like in our era of cell phone video and stuff, Mm. you just don't really see that kind of that type of home movie anymore. Yeah. Um, and so I, I thought that that stood out to me actually, um, it's just like, we're, it, this movie was made in 2003. So it's sort of in that crossover, um, between, you know, you would have had like, ni- you know, nice video cameras, like, you know, mm. or home movie cameras. Yeah, like we're not talking about going back to like the fifties or sixties with it, but at the same time we hadn't leaped into what we kind of now use more with uh, our phones. And so mm. sort of the last vestige of that type of home movie. So y- mm. y- you see that at the very beginning of the movie and then they show it multiple times during the trial too. Yeah. We so didn't know that if was... we were going to use VHS or Blu-ray or DVD <laughs> or laser disc. Yeah. At the yeah. Time. Remember, like, oh, oh man, just like a uh, moment of silence for everybody that bought a laser disc, like player oh, yeah. and invested sure. in that whole system. <laughs> laser disc and then i don't know if you remember this this was even shorter than the laser disc period like there was a little battle for i don't even want to call it a year maybe a year maybe it was a year uh between two different types of what essentially became blu-ray it was blu-ray and then there was another one yeah you remember that yeah i do remember i bought that. the other one of course 
<laughs> like the guy that bought the Sega Genesis instead of the Nintendo. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I bought the other one. And then I, I, I remember sending it back, actually, not a month or so later. It was early days of Amazon. They were still taking stuff back pretty quickly and, and not with too many questions. So, uh, yeah, but but I remember, though, that for sure. And, and that's right. I mean, like, that's where this felt like with, with some of that. The other thing I felt like is, it seemed like, uh, in some ways, a cross between. Uh, there was a lot of. I felt like the firm, like, mm-hmm. uh, like with the again southern stuff, but also just the chase scenes and the music, and and it's just sort of got this like, it's got this almost branding on it that just feels very John Grishamy. Um, but then, uh, sort of a cross between that and. Um, Oh, Enemy of the State, uh, the Gene Hackman, Will Smith movie, which is like yeah. that surveillance movie yeah. Um, oh, yeah, where he plays the, Will Smith plays the lawyer and actually Gene Hackman's in it and as well, I, there's a coincidence, but like, it's sort of like the high tech spying mm-hmm. stuff. And, and it's sort of, you get that with the way that Fitch sets up his kind of command center mm-hmm. with some of this advanced tech that for 2003, like, I mean, it's, it's sort of, some of it's like normal spying stuff with mm-hmm. like just random photos and video, but then you kind of get a little bit more advanced with some of it. Um, and so it seemed like it was also kind of a little bit of a, a cross between those, like not quite to the level of where enemy of the state tech was like mm-hmm. CIA satellites and stuff. But, um, but uh, that was, that was the other thing that kind of jumped out. And I mean, of other things as well, more thematic with like juries and stuff, but, but those are kind of just watching it and seeing it and feeling it. That's kind of what I took. Mm. Good call. But, um, so we've kind of referenced uh, obviously the cast a little bit, and, and I guess I mean this is a this is a big cast um, for really not that high of a budget movie. Um, we'll talk about that, um, but uh, like you said, John Cusack is uh, is one of my all time uh, favorite actors as well, um, and, uh, and and actually Gene Hackman I would probably put. Um, in i don't know a top two or three for me like all time i just i grew up with superman and i loved mm-hmm. lex Luthor and gene hackman yep i love i mean i'm a sports guy so hoosiers is an all-time mm-hmm. sports movie and then i mean he's just been in so many things that i just love he's been in several of these john grishamy movies like the firm and the chamber um and then of course he's won oscars for the french connection which really i've seen but kind of predates me and to my movie life Mm -hmm. um and then unforgiven which i actually went back to watch about a year ago and it was so much fun to watch uh and his role in unforgiven where he wins the oscar for that too um so i love gene hackman oh man uh do you like westerns Mm, not not really really no yeah a couple of them high noon uh, that's classic yeah um yeah i did but yeah Eh, so a couple of I, I'm kind of like, like I'm like more of a uh, like I loved Tombstone in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember going to see it a bunch of times in the theater, but I don't feel like I was like a like a Clint Eastwood, John Wayne type guy either. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what kind of westerns I like, but I remember then Three Ten to Yuma with Russell yeah, Crowe and Christian Bale is fantastic. Yeah, I love that movie. Yeah, yeah. And so was the one about yeah. the OK Corral that had like you know Val Kilmer and like all those guys. Oh, that's Tombstone. Tombstone. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a good one. The Val Kilmer, Kurt Russell. Yeah, yeah. Is, is Tombstone. Yeah. That I mean, that's awesome. Um, and so yeah, I, so I feel like um, Unforgiven uh, is 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 probably somewhere in between kind of the old school western and the new, that new school western maybe. But I don't know. It, it's uh, it's good. Um, and then uh, Dustin Hoffman uh as uh as Wendell Rohr the the plaintiff's lawyer here um you know so I mean what can you say about Dustin Hoffman he's only done pretty much everything uh mm. in in acting over the years um and uh uh what I like about this um is also that uh, Gene Hackman and Dustin Hoffman um as, as well as Robert Duvall um were all friends back in the days before they became famous and they even lived together as they were trying to make it. Um, and they had never Gene Hackman and Dustin Hoffman never been in a movie before this one, wow. which is you think about like how many years of movies have they made and never had a chance to, to be in a movie together. And so that scene, which I'm sure we'll talk about the bathroom scene between the yeah. two of them, that's really the first time they meet talk was a big deal, uh, for them is a big deal. I was reading stories about it. 
um, about the people that wrote it and all of that. So, uh, uh, what a, what a great combo between the two of them. Um, Jeremy Piven is a young guy here, but he's had a big career. Mm. Uh, and, uh, he's been in like every Cusack movie <laughs> in 10 of them, as a matter of fact. Um, and he plays the jury consultant. Um, and he's been on entourage as sort of his now and claim to fame, which I haven't really seen actually, but I, I know that it's a popular, um, uh, show. And then, uh, uh, we have to give a little shout out to Bruce McGill, judge, uh, Harkin here, yeah. who's making a repeat appearance in our <laughs> movies from uh, my cousin, Vinny, the yep. sheriff, yep. uh, on a hunch. Yeah. I looked into, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh he does a good job as the judge yeah uh, nice transition smooth transition for him um and uh i'll briefly mention two others um nick searcy plays doyle who I actually think is an important character in this show and i think he does some pretty good acting in this um kind of plays that uh it's weird. He's like working for this like shady outfit but then he can go and like put on this really honest like all shucks uh you know, very like earnest, honest salesman type deal that mm -hmm. with the accent and everything just plays it really well. Um, and then Marguerite Moreau plays like the right hand for Fitch here, Amanda Monroe, and people just know her from the Mighty Ducks, I guess. So I didn't know that. I had to go back and look. I knew she looked familiar. She hadn't done a whole lot since then, but she was the main girl in all three Mighty Ducks movies. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, let me, let me good. Throw a good couple cast. of other names at you. You got Bill good, good. Nunn. He's the the black guy that was the grocer. Yes. And yes, so he yes, was yes. in Spider-Man. He worked under J. Jonas, J. J. Jonah Jameson at yes. the uh, Daily Bugle or whatever the name of the, the paper is. Yeah, I think it's the Daily Bugle. Uh, he was in New Jack City as the stuttering guy, uh, which was uh, my favorite role of his. And he was in Sister Act. And then you've got Luis Guzman, who was in Carlito's Way. He was a Hispanic juror. Uh, Count of Monte Cristo, Out of Sight. Orlando Jones, who was the black friend at the mall, uh, comedian, Mad TV, American God star. Um, and then David Ramsey. I didn't see his role, but apparently he was in the movie. He was credited, but he's from the arrow for those, for all my nerds out there. Okay. Um, and then David Dwyer, who was the, the, one of the bad guys, uh, he was in, like you said, some of these other kind of tap, typecast roles the firm the blind side remember the titans and robocop 2 yeah um you mentioned luis guzman i love luis guzman um and uh he's in um there it is yeah uh oh, it, it's it's totally inappropriate but it's hilarious um it's waiting um i don't know if you've seen waiting before it's no, basically because no, no, no. i don't watch inappropriate movies <laughs> you're you're too good for a little judgment there uh no, it's it's basically a uh, a movie about uh, it, it's sort of a mockery of what it's like to work at like a Chili's or an Applebee's, <laughs> um, and so Ryan Reynolds is in it, and <laughs> Anna Faris and Justin Long, Luis Guzman. Um, it, it's a it's a pretty big cast. Um, Dane Cook is in it, um, and, and uh, 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 oh, um, Chi McBride is in it. it, it mm. It's just it, it's great. It really is. It it's in a, there's a lot of inappropriate stuff in it, <laughs> honestly. Um, but it really is funny. And uh, Luis Guzman, that's when you said that, that, that reminded me of, of him. We also, uh, I, I skipped over, I didn't mean to uh, skip over Rachel Wise, who is the primary female character in the yeah. show. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about her. And then uh, some of the others that uh, were talked about in terms of playing some of these roles, because this movie went through a few iterations. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention, we've talked about Grisham, obviously we'll get into more of him, I'm sure. And, and both in this and future shows, but I also wanted to mention the writers that adapted it to screen because Brian Koppelman and David Levine, um, have, uh, made a name for themselves more recently with billions uh, on HBO, which is uh, a, a really, uh, uh, successful show. Um, but they also wrote rounders, uh, with Matt Damon and, and Edward Norton back in the day. And then they wrote oceans 13 as well. Um, and then I just, it was on my mind. I'll try to find this and link it. Um, but when Sean Connery passed away over the last week, I guess, or over the weekend, um, 
Koppelman, Brian Koppelman, uh, had a fairly long little tweet story about um, a, an interaction with Sean Connery where they were working on a project together before like Koppelman and Levine had written Billions, before they had, I think, even written Ocean 13. So they were sort of still no one, nobody's. But just the... In, it's just a great story about Sean Connery and it was fun to read it from their perspective anyway. So they, they've been on my mind lately too. Um, and then the other thing I would note before kind of talking about, um, the ratings and stuff and, and how much money this made is the book, uh, the novel was written from the perspective of the defendant company being a tobacco company mm -hmm. uh, rather than a gun manufacturer. Um, and when, the movie The Insider came out um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, which is mostly about a whistleblower and a tobacco case. They decided to change the defendant company to a gun manufacturer and obviously make the other adjustments you'd have to make to switch it from one to the other. Um, so that's a, obviously a difference between the novel uh, and the movie. How does that land on you being a 90s kid? What do you mean? Well, I mean, you and I both, we, we grew up in the nineties and, you know, like school shootings and, and things like that. Like this was not long after Columbine happened. Right. Um, and you know, of course, like the, I mean, Columbine, it looks like it was in 99, but you know, the, yeah. they did a really good job at the beginning of, you know, setting up the, the character that was, you know, going to work and. He was the the husband who had passed in in this deal, but just yeah, you know, like I, like this could have been like you said, this could have been a movie about big tobacco, but instead it was a a movie that was about a verdict for it for a gun company, and so I don't know, I was I was just curious on how that how your 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 uh, background as a '90s kid as I was like just how that informs your your watching of the movie. Yeah, and. and so I, I thinking about it, I didn't know that cause I, I don't, I don't think I had read this novel. So I, until I was doing the research for this podcast, I don't think I knew that it was about a tobacco company before it switched. So, but as I read that and I was thinking about it, I was glad, I think it worked out well uh, for the movie to be about, uh, a, a shooting case and a gun case instead of tobacco, because, um, it feels to me like. Um, by this time in 2003, mm -hmm. uh, that we are sort of beyond the tobacco stuff. Right. I mean, like that feels like yeah. more seventies and eighties Yeah. Um, where it's really a problem in, in the sense of like a legal problem and like, a uh, you know, a, a fraud on the public problem. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I think everybody sort of is, it's like, it's obviously still here with us, but it's more transparent and it's like not, you know, but the gun issue obviously is still white hot. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it feels more relevant to me yeah. to be about guns, not to mention the fact that, and, and, and we can get into this more later, but I mean, you know, that, uh, this movie's made in 2003 and in 2005, uh, president Bush signs a law protecting gun manufacturers from being mm -hmm. sued for people using their guns to commit mass murders like this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and that leads to obviously after Sandy hook, uh, and I'm, I'll get into that a little bit later, but yeah. So like lawsuits brought by families just like this. I mean, mm -hmm. this almost, not that there wasn't a, a suit, before, any lawsuits like this before the movie, but I mean, certainly there have been more after, mm -hmm. um, and, and more need for it after in a lot of ways. So I, I think it makes it more relevant. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and I actually thought they did do it. We didn't talk about it. I think they did do a good job of kind of creating that, um, you know, uh, the scene of what it might be like, uh, if you were in an office building and someone came in shooting, mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously without having experienced that before, I guess there's no way to really know, but I mean, I feel like it felt real to me. Like, I felt like it was something, you know, we've all put ourselves probably in those shoes of like, what would I do if, mm -hmm. um, even if it was just in a training, I don't know about mm -hmm. you. Like sometimes I'll sit in a building or a meeting somewhere. And like, what would I do if a shooter came walking mm -hmm. right in here and started? Buying? Make sure your back's not to the door. Like, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm dead serious. Like, I mean, I, 
Yeah, and yeah, yeah. For for me, growing up as a, a kid in the '90s, and you know, exposed to the different shooting uh, mass shootings that have happened. I mean, starting back at you know Luby's in in Texas, like yeah. way back in the day. I mean, it just. I, I think you're right. Like this, the the topic was white hot, and it still it still is. Like it's oh it's yeah. personal. Like you said, like sure. we're we're kind of beyond the tobacco you know, debate like this, this is a lot like this felt like a closer call if a jury was actually going to be deliberating this. And I mean, and those things they do, they, they shape our, our world and our, and our interactions. And I mean, yeah, like when I, I don't know about you, but when I go inside of a restaurant or like, you know, a building or it's got a lot of people in it, like, I mean, I, if I'm sitting at, at a table, I don't want to be with my back towards the door, you know, and I'm, I'm I don't know. There's just kinds of things that you, you, you're aware of growing up in that era, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I guess that's, yeah. To, and to me, I'm, I'm assuming too, like that this would be a movie that, you know, people that are younger, like a decade younger than us or more even, um, it would still be relevant to, cause they're still living it as well. Like we were, we were kind of, I feel like getting the, like Columbine was kind of the front end of it mm-hmm. and we're not to the back end yet. And no. so like, um, I feel like people that have, you know, even like, you know, obviously millennials or even some of the uh, Gen Z's that are still having to live through some of these, um, you know, mass shooting events, uh, that this movie stays relevant. Whereas if it were about, uh, big tobacco, I mean, it just, it, I just don't think it would make much sense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it may make sense, but it's like, it's just not, it certainly wouldn't be as emotionally engaging. Right. Uh, no doubt about that. Um, this movie was well received um, critically and by audiences in the sense of uh, 7.1 IMDb, 73, 75 on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, it didn't win many awards or anything, and it really didn't make uh, a whole lot of money. Um, I mentioned earlier it was not that big of a budget, $60 million, um, in 2003, which is not nothing. Um, you got to pay those actors. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, it made 80 million worldwide. So it made its money back, made a little bit of money, but really not that much. In fact, uh, I, I, I did see a quote from John Grisham uh, where he said he thought Runaway Jury was a smart, suspenseful movie and was disappointed it made so little money. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, I get that. I think that's that sounds about right. Uh, sounds about right to me. Um, so, uh, cool. Well, what about just, um, thematically in the sense of, we've talked about obviously guns, uh, in the, in the sense of that, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I would say that, um, and I mentioned a couple other things already. Um, you know, I, I think ultimately what, what this raises for me is sort of just taking a step back to think about, you know, um, okay, how, secure is our jury system um Mm -hmm. you know how easy is it to uh uh or hard i guess easier or hard to to get yourself into a database and get yourself onto a jury if you're trying to infiltrate it like nick easter was here Mm -hmm. um and swing it with an agenda um how secure are all those records and files and databases um probably more secure now than they were in 03 but uh, maybe not if it's just sort of a random government database that no one really cares much about, like kind of this implied movie is how easy he was able to get into it. And then also, um, obviously we've had jury consultants for a long time. Um, but at the end of the day, that's what this is about in a lot of ways is the value, the role of jury consultants and whether it's like taking it to the extreme of what, uh, uh, Fitch does or, using it in its more proper role, I would say like the plaintiff's jury consultant is doing, um, you, you know, what, uh, what's the science there? Is it science? Is it, mm-hmm. and, 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 uh, you know, just sort of evaluating, um, uh, sort of that, you know, uh, how do we pick a non-biased jury and, um, and how do we try to go about doing that? I, I mean, I think those are, those are bigger kind of, legal system questions that, that certainly are raised. Yeah. I mean, it definitely as a lawyer now having gone back and watch it, I mean, it really does make you think about like all the different things that we, we try to use to analyze what makes a good juror, what doesn't make a good juror. And just like the way they dress, the way they hold their hands their their reflections when they talk and uh, things that, that, 
sometimes are reliable, but you know, a lot of the times completely aren't. Um, Malcolm Gladwell has a great book called talking to strangers that kind of delves into this. And I mean, yeah, I just, I, I think for, for me, the, um, I, I, the thing that I, I guess what, what, it, what's most important for, so we talked about, you know, the, the theme, this is revolving around a, a gun company that's being sued. Um, but the thing that I've always sort of honed in on, and even now more so as a lawyer, is in the deliberation room when Cusack's character, Easter, is, uh, you know, debating with uh, Frank Herrera, who's the, the former yeah. Marine. Right. And uh, or, you know, Marine retired because you're never not a right. Marine. Right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he, he he gets him to expose his bias and yeah. and you know and there's a lot of it going around the room yeah um and when he and they and they're just wanting to take a preliminary vote at that point in time which in theory isn't going to well i guess in a civil jury it could it could it could resolve the case cuz they only need a majority 9 out of 9 out of 12 but yeah. um but yeah so i the 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 fact that he easter exposes the bias and then says, okay, now what we need to do is review the testimony. We, we need to look at the evidence, which is what they're supposed to do in the first place. Right. Exactly. But, but it's not, it's, it's sadly not often how, how it works. The right. jurors can be very pragmatic and, and just think about like all the biases that they bring into it and use that to, to make their decisions. So I, that there's, there's something there, I think just about the, the message of like doing like the system working the way that it's supposed to, um, yeah. doing, doing the thing that you're supposed to do is, is it shouldn't be something that makes us stand up and applaud. It should just be the normal, but it's not. And so <laughs> the, the yeah. fact that we, you know, that we, that there's, uh, a statement on it, a public statement on it, uh, just really, for me, it's, it's, it's really important. And, and I think, uh, really spoke to me. Yeah. And I think, and, and I'd say very connected to that is, uh, yeah, the importance and value of just jury service as a civic duty. Mm -hmm. Um, it gets mentioned a couple of times, uh, obviously in the movie directly, almost sometimes in jest, cause that's kind of the, what's happening within the movie is, is, mm -hmm. <laughs> is sort of making a mockery of the jury in some ways that it's always for sale or, or can be, um, or at least can be squeezed, um, and moved. Um, but, uh, from a, jury service standpoint too i i did appreciate and enjoyed um the uh the foreman of the jury who came in late to the selection process the blind mm -hmm. man um who wanted to be on the jury and wanted to serve uh you know uh on the jury and and it seemed like didn't have any of the bias i mean i'm sure he had bias all humans have bias but uh, of the group was you know sort of the most uh clear-headed about it and wanted to do uh, do his, uh, civic duty, um, mm -hmm. to serve. And I loved even having, he had, he was ready for the judge with his case law. Yeah. Uh, state V Jack state V Jack, which I looked Two. that up. Yeah. Uh, did you real look case. it up? Yeah, yeah. 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 Real case. But I, I didn't, I, I didn't see the particular issue though. Um, that hit him, uh, directly. I, I didn't, I, I saw it. I saw another case that referenced, uh, something similar, but State versus Jack Louisiana Supreme Court from like 73, um, I think, uh, had a number of issues in it. I, I didn't see one directly on point with his, but um, some some kind of similar ones with jury, but not that. I don't know. Did you see something different? I remember looking this up a long time ago um, because I was interested in it. And I remember it turning on the question of whether or not the juror could could review the evidence, like wh whether or not there mm. was going to be some like, um, and I, and there's, there's even, I even looked this up in, in Texas, there's a, a case that's, uh, similar and it, it, it has to do with, um, let's see here. So, uh, going back to your question, so state V Jack, this is two eighty five South second two Oh four from 1973 in the Supreme court of, right. uh, Louisiana. And, um, and they address they address probably twelve or thirteen I think uh, issues on appeal uh, in that in that case. Yeah, yeah, and so um, 
they basically went along with the trial court and said, you know, the trial court's in the best position to determine whether or not the the juror that served was acceptable or not. The, the different and there was it wasn't it wasn't just one juror. I mean, this this uh, challenge turned on the motion was grounded on the alleged exclusion of women Negroes, persons between twenty one and thirty years of age. Uh, yeah, persons. Yeah, not so that's what I mean. it wasn't directly to a point of a blind person yeah, yeah, yeah. who wanted to serve and wasn't allowed to, which is sort of the way they made the case kind of fit the mm. uh, the fictional thing here. But it was a real case. It did mm. connect to juries. But I just like that that Herman Grimes is the juror, so I I, I like Herman's. Uh, and then of course uh, Nick Easter does his thing to prop him up as the foreman. Yeah. Uh, in the early part of the uh, of the case. Yeah. Um, and I know I remember looking up back when I was a prosecutor about those exclusions. And basically, like if there is if 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 you can review the evidence, even if it's, you know, just difficult, um, but you have a disability, then you I mean, just having the disability by itself doesn't right. prevent you from being a juror. Yeah. So yeah. makes sense. So what are, you kind of started to talk about this a little bit earlier, but I'm curious just in your experience and as you've picked a juries uh, over the years, um, you know, you watch that there's kind of that um, compilation scene um, where they're showing uh, short clips and videos or pictures of each prospective juror. And then, you know, it's sort of like uh, challenge her or, you know, mm -hmm. she's in or he's out or whatever. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I thought, I mean, you know, right out of the gate, um, uh, they're talking about like, well, they've got like with Easter, it's like, okay, so, you know, he's an entertainer and he wants to make everybody <laughs> happy and, you know, kind of stuff like that. And, 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 uh, Fitch even says right then at the very beginning, he's a risk. Mm -hmm. He knew he couldn't, he didn't, he, he didn't have him figured out, um, at that point. Um, and that he was a risk. Um, but then, uh, you know, I, so what, uh, of some, as they went through some of those things, um, did anything ring true with you? Like, oh yeah, I would normally want, like if I was them, I would want that person on the jury because of the reasons they said or, or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, there's some stereotypes that, that get applied. Um, you know, the one that I think hit, closest to home was the, the stereotype about overweight people. Um, so there was the prospective juror Dolores Kennerly and they're watching her. She's walking on the sidewalk Yep. and, uh, there's a dog that she shies away from. And, uh, the two guys that are in the room analyzing said, yeah, she's definitely self-conscious about her weight. And then Gina Hackman's character comes in, says maybe she just doesn't like dogs. We love fat women. They're tight-fisted. They're unsympathetic. We love fat women, people. <laughs> they're tight-fisted, unsympathetic. I want her on my jury. Ladies and gentlemen, let's find 11 more jurors and three alternates just like her. And, I mean, I've, I've been in rooms where I've heard similar generalizations made of, of different, of different groups. Um, one of the, the more notorious um, generalizations applied to jury selection was in Harris County. I think it was where there was, um, a district attorney's office that was excluding all the minorities and they were referring to them inter office as, uh, I think they were calling them Eskimos. And so they, you know, there are all these, uh, you know, memos and things out there, emails were to say, you know, so-and-such won a case despite having, you know, X number of Eskimos on the jury or something like that. Right. Um, you know, there's stereotypes that are made about minorities. Um, you know, why, you know, why they, they shouldn't be, uh, why they can't serve, be fair. Um, and lots of, lots of case law that's built over that, including bats. And, um, but you know, the, the, as, as both a prosecutor and a defense attorney, the ones that I've seen quite a bit is, you know, we're interested when a juror comes in holding a book or they're reading uh, some material of some sort. Um, because, I mean, just the fact that you're reading, I mean, yeah, it, for entertainment value, sure. I mean, just to to buy the time. But, I mean, the people people buy the time a lot of different ways. And so just kind of stereotypically, 
you know, the idea of someone bringing a book to read uh, suggests this a higher scholarship or, or level of, of intelligence or <laughs> um, learnability, teachability. Um, we want to know what they're reading. You know, is it, you know, romance novel or is it, you know, uh, you know, comedy or is it, you know, some, is it, guns uh, will kill us all. Yeah. 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 You know, oh, what's that it, book you're reading? Man? Is it mind comp for, you know, what do we, or what do we got over there? Um, you know, so, uh, tattoos, you know, I'm interested in seeing, you know, whether people have tattoos, um, and yeah. you know, whether they're trying to hide it or whether they're, uh, you know, proudly displaying it, how they're dressed, you know, if they're, if they're dressed up in a suit in a tie, um, I mean, it could be that they're that way because of their work. It could be that they're that way just because they want to put their best foot forward. They think, Hey, I'm in the, the legal system, but I mean, sometimes, uh, and I feel like a lot of times that kind of communicates, they want to be on the jury. And so then I'm like, okay, so what's the agenda there? Why do they want to be on the jury? <laughs> so right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like all, I mean, we're, we're constantly looking uh, both sides, they, we, we call them the cereal jurors, They're your nuts, your fruits and your flakes. And we, 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 we want to know who they are and we, you know, we want to, yeah. to know what they, they add or take away from our jury panel. Yeah. Yeah. It's super interesting. And, and, uh, and, and, and really, yeah. I mean, like you said, like you're, you're, you're almost bringing in so many of these stereotypes based on mm -hmm. how people present. And then, Really, it seems like in Bordier, like the job is to try to figure out, okay, does that actually apply to this person or not? Right. Like I may start there, but I can't mm -hmm. assume that, you know, that's who this person actually mm -hmm. is or exactly what, right. you know, yeah. I mean, which is, which is tricky. And I um, thought it was interesting that Hackman's character, you know, they, they started the trial but he, he tells his people, don't let up on researching these jurors either. I want you to keep finding out yeah. things about them. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Um, they were excited when they found out the, the one woman had the pastor's, it was the mm -hmm. pastor's wife who had had an abortion from another guy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's a, a <laughs> looking for leverage points they could potentially use. Um, I, I liked when they were going through that and, uh, the actual lead defense counsel's in the room with them and uh and the um and hackman says uh i think she'd make an excellent juror don't you or i think it's herrera i think he'd make an excellent uh jury foreman don't you don't you uh mm. and uh the lawyer says i think frank herrera would make an excellent jury foreman don't you mr cable well i'm only lead counsel for the defense mr fitch i don't pretend to know very much about jury selection really I'm only lead counsel for the defense. I don't pretend to know very much about jury selection. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I just like that. Cause you know, like you got to actually think about, okay, this is a guy who presumably is one of the best civil lawyers in the region, if not the nation representing the gun companies in this ma major lawsuit, hiring the best jury consultant they could find. And he just sits there basically as kind of a, you know, uh, totally handing off this whole thing to, yeah. uh, to Fitch. <laughs> um and trusting him completely um the the, uh, the other line from uh, fitch has a lot of great lines by the way in, in this movie there's just so many um when they talk about uh I, I, it may have been that same woman actually i can't remember i guess it was uh where, and he says oh i, I hate baptists almost as much as i hate democrats yeah. <laughs> 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 that's classic Oh, I think we get a large swath with that comment. So hopefully don't offend every, hopefully offend everybody or a lot of people equally. Uh, oh, no, hey, full disclosure. This is uh, being recorded on November 6th, 2020. We, we are three days after uh, general uh, election voting has started. So we're, we're going to lose at least half our audience here. Oh, oh, so. okay. We're losing <laughs> half. Okay. Um, Oh, here's, I was going to ask you this. It, it seemed weird to me. I mean, like in real life, obviously you just got to make some things happen in movies to move things along and, and all that. Uh, uh, Herrera seemed like an obvious problem for the mm -hmm. plaintiffs mm -hmm. to me. Yep. And that he didn't like, and like I said, like the movie has to do certain things. So maybe it's reading too much to do, it, but like, if you're the plaintiff's lawyer, if you're Dustin Hoffman, are you not bouncing Herrera? I mean, he, and he, I, I don't know. Like, 
That yeah, one I'm, seemed weird. I mean, obviously yeah. the fence was all about having him on the jury and wanted to make him the foreman. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if so. What I noticed about him was that Fitch's team knew that he was a Marine retired, and now he was cleaning pools, and he had been at least twice divorced, and so he wanted to be in charge again. Was kind of their th- yeah. thought in keeping him. I don't know how much of that the defense knew. I don't know if they knew that he was a, f- a former that he was a how veteran. Much the plaintiffs knew. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah I said the, yeah, the defense. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if they knew that he was former military, but that's uh, yeah. I'd, I wouldn't want a f- I wouldn't want someone with military experience on on a gun case, you know, like a trained soldier. Like I, I don't. Yeah. You know, and and, the, and all the. The baggage of you know the the constitutional rights that they're sworn to defend that go along with them and how that clashes with you know your theory of the case that this is an abuse of the second amendment like that 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 just wasn't i don't know how he got it on that jury and then well and you referenced this earlier actually but it's funny because uh actually easter uh in the jury room at the end really does the vor dire on herrera that mm-hmm. the plaintiffs should have done yep yeah i mean Walking him all the way out onto that limb, mm-hmm. all by himself, <laughs> where no one else wanted to go. Yep. And then you know, okay, who else feels like Frank here? And let's yep. just get rid of all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I see that hand. Thank you. All right. <laughs> like that yeah. was the board ire. Yeah. Was it Nick Easter late in the process? That was it. Um, anything else before we want to jump into some awards? Yeah. So I, you know, uh, on the idea of themes, one of the 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 things that said by Fitch early on in this case, and I think it's during that, maybe even that same kind of control room scene, uh, he says trials are too important to be left up to jurors. Uh, it's the best line. These people are looking for a leader. They'll follow Frank Herrera. If they elect someone else for me. Whoever they vote for will be following me, just like in Cincinnati and Oakland and Pittsburgh. Gentlemen, trials are too important to be left up to juries. <laughs> Man. You know, and I don't know what to do with that because here's, here's, the, <laughs> here's the thing. I mean, uh, you know, I, I can wrap myself around the American flag all day and I can talk about just how important jury trials are to our, our justice system and how yeah. we've got the, the best justice system in the world and all that. But there is something to the idea of... If you're a lawyer, you go to school for 12 years high school, four years college, three years law school. Um, you know, some people come to law school after their you know second, third careers. And you learn all this stuff about all, all this education. You learn all this stuff about the law. And then you, you're proceeding in front of a judge who is also a trained lawyer who's, you know, had the same training and experience that you have. And then your jury is 12 average citizens from the community who don't have a lot of education and not necessarily a lot of life experience. And you're trying to take these huge lofty academic ideals and reduce them to succinct, basic concepts for the lay person it just feels like there's this huge disconnect there sure like some somebody's missing something either either like do we want to give them more education or do we want to do we want to require less of the the advocates i mean i i it just feels weird yeah and it i think there's there's sort of a a a very um honest and practical um, you know, r- reason behind wanting to like, for example, like what you, the, the idea of what you just said about, you know, taking really complicated stuff and, and trying to boil it down for, uh, people, um, to make decisions about, I think is why uh, legitimately, I think a lot of parties, both on the plaintiff and defense side, um, oftentimes prefer to just do a bench trial with a judge mm-hmm. or, uh, go to arbitration to where there's people that have been appointed that have more experience uh, in these particular areas to make these decisions so that the juries uh, uh, aren't involved. Um, mm-hmm. And I think there's a legitimate 
rationale for a lot of that. And then you've got that combined with sort of the, you know, um, I would say malicious intent of Mm -hmm. Fitch here to say, you know, not just that, but that, um, we're we're just not going to, you know, allow a jury to yeah. make their own decision about this case. Like it's right. too important. Yeah. Um, and, and I also love the context that that quote is given in. He's in the room with the other five CEOs of the gun companies who are funding this defense and putting all their, you know, money into it. Mm. Uh, and, and it's basically just your, what you would expect of like a, you know, a cigar room with Mm -hmm. the back room deals, uh, Mm -hmm. kind of thing going on. And, uh, and when he delivers that line and when he says it, you know, they're already kind of upset at him because they'd already given a bunch of money to start. And now he's there to ask them for more. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when he says that line, they all, all five of them just sort of chuckle at it you know mm-hmm. like, and it's all just sort of this understood <laughs> yeah he's yeah. right we're, we're gonna buy this thing and uh, you can't trust juries with this um and uh and then later that's the ceo the main ceo i love that line that he gives later when he's getting on fitch again when it's obviously getting out of hand just because somebody can influence where a jury has lunch, that doesn't mean they can hand us the verdict. Ah, well, you see, Mr. Fitch, this is where I get a little confused because I was under the impression that we had already purchased ourselves a verdict. He says, see, that's what I, I, that's where I'm misunderstanding because I was under the impression we already purchased ourselves a verdict. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and listen, let's, let's pretend for a moment that this is in real life, right? So you're Fitch. You've convinced uh, this conglomerate of, uh, you know, uh, multimillionaires in the smoky cigar room in the back of the lounge to, to give you money. And then you gave you got them to give you more money. And then your uh, extortionist uh, requires more money of you than you're willing to pay. Originally, it was five hundred thousand. So she, she gets more out of you than you're wanting to pay. You try to kill her. Or, or to kidnap her, and that doesn't kidnap work. Kidnap her, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so then the, the price goes up again, and then you lose. That's brutal. So, so does, does Fitch live after this? <laughs> is, is he dead? Man, uh, you know, yeah, what does he do next? Um, you know, my guess is that uh, Nick and Marley haven't heard the last of him. Um you know, it, it ends with a, you know, somewhat happy ending uh, for all but Fitch. But I don't think Fitch is done because, I mean, he he now has nothing to lose and everything's been stripped from him. But he is obviously uh, uh, very capable um, of, of doing certain things and he has no conscience or morality to prevent him from doing anything. So yeah. um, I don't think those two uh, are, are are done with with Fitch yet. Um and uh because the only leverage they really have on him is that wire transfer and if he can figure out how to deal with that then he can he can kind of be back in the game and and move on um but yeah no you're you're right Uh, (laughs) his uh his world's at a different point at the end of this thing so in these awards our, our awards here um it's funny because i i struggled i've got a couple but i i kind of struggled with uh our best lawyering award Mm. Um, I've got plenty of things for some of the others, but, uh, you know, we don't see a a ton of actual lawyering in this. Um, and some of it that we do see, I didn't think was all that great. (laughs) True. (laughs) I am curious if you came up with the same moment I did though. Well, I'll, I'll let you go first and I'll, uh, so, uh, so for best lawyering, what, what are, what's something or some things that, that you have down? It's Roar badgering the the owner of the the gun company, the manufacturer, yeah, and getting the cross him, on him, yeah, and getting him to blurt, you know, what did he, what did he say, something like, I I stand on the second amendment, beep, you know, um, kind of yes. like that, uh, what is that, a few good men, I ordered the code red moment. So 
though that's not your problem. Why don't you just tell us? Objection, Your Honor. It is the government's responsibility. Say to the jury, sir, that it's not your problem. Well, Say to my client, Celeste Wood, who lost her husband, S that it's not answer, your sir. problem. Sustain, Mr. Mr. Tell to you the whole point that me, the former 990 with the current assistant finish is not your problem. So in my notes on best witness moment, the Colonel Jessup Award. Yeah. I have that CEO with his Second Amendment declaration as his code red moment. Yes. So we are on the same wavelength for that. And you're right. I should have probably crossed that with uh, the lawyering that got him to do it. So that, that's a good one for sure on the lawyering, best lawyering award. Yeah. Okay. So we're, so did you, is that your best lawyer award too? Yeah, it, 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 it certainly can be. Um, you know, I, uh, yeah, I just, no, I don't want to pressure you. You no, you, like I really, I'm looking at my categories for best lawyering and I really have zero things. written. <laughs> next. I have stuff, like I said, like I have stuff written next to all these others and some of them do kind of come from some of the lawyering, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, th I thought actually the, the defense did some decent objecting through some stuff, um, that was, uh, that was obvious and, and, uh, and that was good. I, I, you know, I thought it was important to like, uh, it would have been important. I would assume, uh, for, uh, roar to get on the record. And he did, um, uh, he made his motion to, uh, adjourn or take a, a, a short recess to try to find his key witness. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, uh, the judge denied it basically and said, no, we're not, we're not waiting any longer. Um, and then, uh, the judge actually gave him, I assume that's your motion for reconsideration yeah. denied, um, <laughs> which is all good. Cause I mean, I think ultimately uh, if, if it goes the other way, like not letting your, not giving you an extra few minutes to try to track down your primary witness is probably at least grounds for uh, uh, an appeal there. So, um, you know, get, getting some of that stuff, you know, just in the record for appeal is important. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you a quick story. I, I have been yeah. there. That is a real thing. When judges get, uh, 12 elected voter or uh, 12 voting, uh, registered voters in the, in the, uh, the, the jury box. Yeah. And you know, they do not want to upset these, these people that are going to vote for their, their race later on. And I mean, the, it just doesn't matter what, you know, what your evidence is. I mean, if you, you better, <laughs> if the judge wants you to move along, then I mean, he will shut the whole case down. Oh, man. I had a situation where a judge, uh, he threw a, a curveball at me. We, we, in this particular courtroom, the tradition was you always, you pick your jury before lunch, you break for lunch, and then you start your testimony after lunch. And we got done with our jury selection, I think at like 1130 that day. And instead of breaking for lunch, this particular judge wanted to mess with me, man. This was, this is more than a decade ago. Ago, Yeah. Uh, he wanted to mess with me. And so he said, no, we're, we're doing, we're doing uh testimony now, you know, put, do your opening statement, call your first witness. And I was trying a case with a guy that this was his first trial ever, his first jury trial. It's fresh out of law school. <laughs> I lean over and I tell him, I need you to give a 15 minute opening statement. <laughs> And he does. Oh, and no. I, you know, I walk out the courtroom and I'm calling my witnesses and I'm like, I need you here now, you know? And so, but it, it, it was hilarious. That is... He really did. He gave a 15 minute. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Closing arguments, I think was like 10 minutes. He gave a 15 minute opening. It was great. Oh man. <laughs> that is hilarious. No, you're right. I, and I, I mean, I know that's a thing for sure is, is really the judges do all they can to take care of, the jurors, because um, like you said, the, those are the voters. And that's really the only time that, you know, judges run for election, but they don't really campaign in the way that others mm -hmm. do. And so like their interaction with the community uh, outside of their own social networks are, are just with the jurors. And those mm -hmm. are the people that are going to talk about them when they leave and uh, and spread with their friends, you know, what it was like to, you know, for this judge or that judge. And so I think you're right. Like the jurors are their one of their, if not their biggest constituency that they are caring about in the, uh, um, in, in the courtroom. Um, and so, yeah, no, no uh, what did he say to him? Uh, you should have kept a title leash on him. Yeah. <laughs> that witness. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't really know exactly how they, uh, made that one disappear. Um, mm. but, uh, so yeah, no, th those are all, those are all good. Um, the, uh, Aaron Brockovich award, for uh our best investigation or discovery 
prepping moment. So, uh, I, I like Doyle's work, uh, in this, uh, for the, uh, defense, you know, he basically is the one that figures out and tracks down what Easter and Marley are up to and Mm why, um, I have two beefs with it. One is not his fault. One is his fault. Um, I mean, I think that that whole scene, and it really culminates, actually. The last scene is really just the kind of juxtaposition of the jury deliberating while Doyle is putting together all the pieces out in Indiana. Mm -hmm. Um, And kind of they're kind of happening simultaneously in real time and going back and forth between the two scenes. If someone as good at this as Fitch... Uh, knew that Easter was a risk. This should have been investigation number one. Like, mm-hmm. and, and like, let's figure this guy out. And let's, they, they should have had this done earlier to me. Mm-hmm. And then two, so they hadn't paid the money yet. Fitch mm-hmm. hadn't paid the money yet. And the jury wasn't quite into the deliberation yet. And uh, Doyle knows he's on his way to Gardner, Indiana. Mm-hmm. He's in the car. And he's on the phone with Fitch and he's saying, oh, I've just got to, I'm on my way to some, you know, whatever town. He just kind of generically describes it in Indiana. Mm. If he says, I'm going to Gardner, Indiana. Right. It ends it. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. It's immediate that Why? Fitch will know yeah. exactly what's going on. Yeah. It should have and raised that, some flags. <laughs> it would have been over. He would not have paid the money. He would have known. He would have taken two seconds to kind of piece it together took longer for Doyle to kind of actually get it all together. Mm. So that was my one, like I, 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 it was still like good work. It wound up not, it wound up being just a little bit late. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, so that was, that was mine. Do you, uh, have anything on this one? Yeah. So that I, I ended up giving it to Doyle too, but the thing that was, I, I had some things that were, they weren't as as poignant as as what you pointed out, but they were a little. I just didn't understand them. So like, he, I mean, he goes to the school. He meets with the guy's professor. Well, actually, yes. backing backing that up. So he goes to the the house, and the guy's like, "Yeah, he doesn't live here. I'm getting his mail for him." Right. The guy that he was talking to looked like the first witness that the plaintiff called. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. And so, so then he's like, okay, so yeah, this is a letter for Jeff Kerr, care of David Lancaster. So he goes to Cincinnati, he goes to the school, he finds the the f- picture of David Lancaster, and it's it's the guy, it's it's Easter, and I mean, I I feel like at that moment, like whether we knew what Easter was up to or not, like there's enough going on there. Yes. That I, that I feel like, okay, wait a minute. That's Easter. Call up the boss. Hey, he's actually this other person. There's something shady going on. Like, I I kind of feel like it should have ended there. Right, right. But then he, he goes, you know, a step forward and he goes to, to Indiana and, and finds the information. So I, I, I do think that that's where I give it um, the, yeah. the Aaron Brockovich Award. But it, it was just weird. Um, yeah. Some runner ups though I had um I, I guess it's so what the uh Marley. Marley Marley following uh, you know, around Easter. She's in the, the mall, she's um watching him uh observe the the different uh, like the photographers and the guys on the mic and, and things like that. Like they're just kind of blown like it it felt like I guess it wasn't a pure investigation, but they they knew that they were being surveilled, and there was just all this backstory that was set up in the apartment, and all the stuff that was in the apartment. He had only moved to uh, New Orleans for like eight months ago, and just like the the way that she did all her research, and just uh, she 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 did a pretty good job. Um, but I think that the the Doyle. Um, Montage, thank you. Uh, yeah. The the Doyle montage. Yeah. Uh, I, I like the way that they set that up, so I'll give it to him. Yeah, yeah. No, those are th- those are good. Um, I also like. I'll just mention it here because it makes probably the most sense. But uh, the whole it's so weird that whole deal with the uh, the muscle guy Janovich. Yeah. Let's send back. You guys are going back in. So take Janovich. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Janovich can find anything. <laughs> <laughs> he goes in there with the crowbar, just beating at yeah. the door, beating at the walls. No disintegration. Oh, he looks yeah. down at the floor. Oh, it must be under there. Because who? 
<laughs> he, what? He was a what? weird. Yeah, he was. He was a. That was a strange kind of enforcer. It was. Of, okay, I mean, like the. <laughs> I tell you, though, one of the things that made me think about this movie, in in terms of Halloween, was the scene where he's waiting for Marley in her apartment, and he's made a sandwich and he just oh, and leaves it. Yeah. And there's like cockroaches all over it. Yeah. It's just like this, this needlessly creepy yeah. moment. <laughs> what is going on? I thought we were and watching way, a law movie. Like <laughs> good for Marley for kicking the crap out of that guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. That was great. Oh, like, and like, I mean, was it not obvious that she was doing something in that refrigerator door with like putting that, bottle of uh, whatever into her jacket to hit him with like she's yeah, sitting yeah. there at the door yeah. like kind of like ah. nine bottles he's of like beer in the be, bag like, 99 bottles of so beer weird. that whole part was weird yeah um and uh but i do like too how uh we haven't talked about this i don't think yet how fitch refers to everybody by their formal title and last name you know like mr janovich mm. uh mr easter Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, he like everyone in the room, like uh, everyone that he's working with, he uses all all the proper names. It's interesting. Um, best uh, judge moment, the Chamberlain Haller Award. We've talked about the judge a little bit already. Mm-hmm. Um, wanting to move things along. Uh, um, you know, I I, I did like how he dressed down uh, Nick Easter for trying to get out of jury service to go to the Madden Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Fair excuse too. Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna say uh, bringing the jury to the restaurant when he realizes yep. that the food sure. hasn't gotten to them. I would strongly advise you to return to that jury room and finish your lunch. That's the problem, sir. I think somebody forgot to order our lunch. The jury had no lunch. That's why I'm here, sir. Everybody knows you're here in the Ferris. They know you like to keep a tight schedule on your bench. If we're gonna be back in less than 45 minutes, I gotta be honest with you, sir. We're hungry. But what exactly, Mr. Easter, would you like me to do? Hey, Donnie, Donnie, could you pass me some garlic bread? You got any over there? Oh, absolutely, man. Oh, man. Delicious. That's great. <laughs> what? Uh, the jury hadn't been fed yet. Jury has no lunch? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, no, I, the, I, like I said, I thought, uh, the, the judge did well in here and I feel so bad. Actually, I tried to find it earlier. I don't know if you'll remember this, but after we did my cousin Vinny or soon after that, someone messaged me and I, I haven't found it yet, but I, I will. And I'll try to go back and credit somehow, uh, that, uh, the act, the actor, um, uh, Bruce McGill. I think it was a LinkedIn message. I have to. So if if you listen to this show, this was you. Hit, send me this again. That like Bruce McGill is a relative of yours. Oh, one wow. of our. Well, yeah. Uh, rel- Bruce McGill is a relative of someone who had reached out to me after my cousin Vinny. Um, and now I'm forgetting who it was, and I apologize. But I wanted Man. to mention it because that's How really cool. cool. Would it be to have him on the show. Yeah, yeah. Let him. Uh, yeah, we've done two of his movies. We'd love to talk to him. So. If we can never uh, get him on the line, that would be so much fun. We would just do a whole podcast just talking to him about those two movies and the rest of his career, which I'm sure is great. <laughs> um, all right, let's take a quick break to share a few of the exciting job opportunities that we are currently searching for here at Varsity Search. We have an education law firm in Austin looking to hire a 5- to 12-year attorney, a Tarrant County trial firm hiring a family law associate, a Dallas construction law firm hiring multiple attorneys, and several law firms in Dallas hiring in general litigation. Now, each of these firms will allow you to miss a day of work for the Madden Challenge if that's something that interests you. (laughs) Okay, they won't. But if you or someone you know might have interest in any of these opportunities, please email me, daniel at varsitysearch.com or go to varsitysearch.com slash lawyers for more information or to apply. Now, back to Runaway Jury. So, okay, we've got the Chamberlain Howler Award. Um, I already mentioned my Colonel Jusp Award. You already did as well with that uh, moment on the stand with the CEO um, for best witness moment. Um, The other one that I actually, (laughs) I got a kick out of this time was, uh, and I don't know if it was intentional or not. It would have been pretty uh, savvy if it was actually. 
where um, the retailer, the one that you were saying before looked like the guy that was at the house, uh, the ponytail mm. or the long haired yeah. guy. Yeah. The gun retailer. Um, yeah. And Roar is asking him about uh, like how the manufacturer uh, incentivized him to sell their weapons and all of that. And then he says, and isn't it true that you got to go with your wife on a trip to Jamaica? Mm. And they go, and he says, no, <laughs> which created this really neat pause. Yeah. And then Roar says, no, we went to Cancun. My wife hates Jamaica. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like, and so I don't know if, if that was intentional on the lawyer's part, but actually I think it worked it, yeah. in the, it, you know, to kind of create that like, oh, you know, do you have this wrong? No, I got it right. And he's yeah. just going to, yeah, it just was really good. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it just like, uh, gave him some, some more appeal to the jury. Some charisma. Yeah. Yeah. I know that, that, that was good. <laughs> Which I mean, also from just like a, I mean, that's kind of a deep character building moment if you think about it like his wife like they've been apparently they've been to jamaica before and his wife didn't wasn't thrilled with jamaica like she hated jamaica so this time they went to cancun with the illegal <laughs> money you know like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah oh so this isn't the first trip you guys have taken right. on the right. uh, manufacturer's dime <laughs> uh how many have you been on right. uh yeah this uh, time we didn't fly first class <laughs> all right uh do you have any other uh witness ones um no i mean the, the thing that was hard about that same witness is he's the one that flipped on them mm. right isn't he isn't he the uh, there was like, no there's another one it was more of like uh, there was the uh, the other witness was the um so the retailer guy that we were just talking about sold guns to another guy who then sold them to the shooter that's right. So yeah, there was yeah, like yeah, another sorry. intermediary, which yeah, actually yeah, yeah. was a little complicated to have like multiple people. Yeah. And I'm sure like if I'm a juror, like we're going from the gun manufacturer to a retailer yeah. to an on the street dealer, essentially yeah. to the shooter. Right. That's that's a pretty like long chain there. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, yeah. No, you're right. So no, but, that was... but it, yeah, no, but yeah. you're right. The other guy did flip and then the other witness just never showed up. Yeah. The, the whistle, the actual whistleblower. Yeah. We, we don't know where that guy is, but he's no, no, he was, he was, he and Finch uh, are probably going to Colonel Markinson on us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> hopefully he had a, hopefully he just got paid off and left though. And didn't actually like, yeah. um, okay. Uh, Oh, let's, uh, let's run our, uh, let's run our tests. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First Bechtel up, test. Bechtel. Yes. All right. You want to so remind us what the Bechtel so we test is? So our uh, our test that we run through each movie, just to you know uh, keep everybody in check around here, uh, we want to find out, is there a conversation that occurs between a person of color and another person of color, and the subject of that conversation is not a white person? Mm-hmm. Right? That's yeah. the best that's, simplest that's way a, I can say it. Yeah. And we call that one the Callahair test. Oh, that's the Callahair test. I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. the Bechtel one is the women. Okay. I fl- I apologize. I just gave the Callahair test. The act which we made up, uh, but the Bechtel test is actually a real thing in social science, I suppose. Uh, or a real I mean, test that's out a there. real thing. The yeah, Callahair well, test is a real thing. Callahair test it's, it's real, but you know, I mean, not patent like... pending, but I mean it's a real thing. <laughs> patent pending. Yeah. Shark Tank would throw us out because we don't have the patent <laughs> in place. Right. Um, but <laughs> Bechtel test is the, let's start there. Sorry, I should have done that for I got ahead of myself. Uh is uh are two women having a conversation about a subject that's not a man. Um so Anything. that's that's the Bechtel test. Which Sandwiches. led to the ins- <laughs> brooms uh, anything cars so loans. do we have two women talking to each other no <laughs> we don't we don't even have them talking to each other no i didn't see any did you no no here 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 we, we we're not going to win the bechtel test here but uh at the very beginning the uh voodoo shop candle shop <laughs> owner <laughs> and marley have a little conversation in Cajun or something about about uh, the candles, 
And uh, <laughs> but it's completely, I would say, about Nick. So I don't think it qualifies. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is how far we have to stretch this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm not giving it a pass there. I'm just saying, like, they do at least have a conversation, sort of. Um, <sighs> and no, and then the other like main female character um, is Fitch's uh, right hand person, um, and she doesn't have any conversations with Marley or any conversations with. They kind of have that other female character. Um, who's like going in and flirting with the jurors to get them yeah. to tell them stuff. Um, yeah. I forget her name now, Suzanne or something, but like, I don't think she ever has a conversation with one of the other female characters. So I don't mm-hmm. think I, I got another candidate for you. Okay. W- when Marley is wearing the wig, leaves the courtroom, walks out, hands the two envelopes to the bailiff. I guess. Because <laughs> <laughs> the bailiff was the, yeah, was, was a woman. But, but she um, did ask the, the bailiff to give those to the two male lawyers that are lead counsel lawyer. for, for both sides. So, yeah. Which, by the way, let's like talk for a second real. Like, uh, it, what, like what, if, a, if in your courtroom today if you if we were having trials right now and you were in court and some strange person gave two (laughs) envelopes to the bailiff and said give them to robert and to the da right right what would that bailiff do right yeah like Like, are you gonna just give them to you i mean probably okay well uh, i don't know i'm asking but i I mean probably but at the same time i mean you, you she she walked 10 feet away from the lead counsel table in order to walk 90 feet to the back of the room and then hand the yeah. envelopes to the bailiff. So I, I guess I understand why she did it because she wanted to have that intermediary, but yeah, but yeah. Right. So man, I don't think we're passing the Bechtel test on this. One. I don't think so either. All right. And then to the Callahair test, which is what yes. I uh, mistakenly referenced earlier as the Bechtel test. It's actually the Callahair test, which is, two people of color having a conversation about a, another person or anything else. That's not a white person. Yes. Um, let me set up. Let me set up how easy this would have been for us. Okay. <laughs> we've got, uh, we're going to rewrite uh, a little bit of this here. We've got Eddie Weiss. Who Compliment is, and Levine. Listen up. Here we go. We're going to do a little <laughs> quick edit. On the fly here. <laughs> we got Eddie Weiss. Who's the, the black uh, juror who uh, they later found out had HIV. Yes. We've got Laureen Duke, who is the black juror who yes. has the curly hair. We've got Sylvia yep. DeShazo, who is the black juror with dreads. Right. We've got um, the lady in the candle shop or the, the, the you know, the voodoo uh, uh, kind of uh, what, what do they call it? like the, the novelty shop where the, the candle is. We've got um, Mr. Which one is he? The the grocer. You got the grocer? Yeah. I, you got Herrera? Yeah. Oh, yes. Herrera. Herrera. Okay, and so then we, uh, Luis Guzman, right? Oh, the yeah. Other that's juror. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got, got one, got, two, got three, a, a good four, five, six. I'm just from. Yeah. And but not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they showed up. Well, we've done some movies where there just aren't any people of color like in right. the movie at all. Like, right. Like, who would you have picked to have the conversation? Like, you just couldn't have found them. They weren't right. there. This is not the problem here today. <laughs> we, but, but even still, with six jurors of color, we have no conversation between two jurors of color. And I don't think any conversation... Well, okay, let me, let me walk that back. Uh, Guzman, after Herrera goes off on his rant, Guzman does say, that's messed up, Frank. Yeah, he does. That's it. <laughs> that is yeah. the extent of two minorities talking to each other in this film. I think. And, and that was really about uh, we even had a black Celeste bailiff. Wood. Yeah. <laughs> the white woman plaintiff. Right. At the end of the day. Yeah. You, we, could have had, we could have had one of the jurors asking the black bailiff, hey, where's a good place for coffee around here? <laughs> Ten seconds, Done. Man, 
Don't set the just, bar too high there, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be a little uh, unreasonable. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is New Orleans. We can't have anybody <laughs> talking to one another. What's going on? Well. <laughs> I mean, it's not a beignet shop somewhere. That- <laughs> something. I mean, we've got the candle shop. It's all set up. Right. Oh. <laughs> uh, Oh uh, yeah, I mean they, they they had the car, they had the street car, right? Like I mean, like the street car. Give us two seconds of like, hey, is this? Do I get off here? Or like, yeah, a driver <laughs> and a get and a passenger could have a conversation about where to get off for this or that. Um, I swear, minorities can act. I swear, if you just give them a little <laughs> license, you know, you had a uh, man. There's just there. Oh, there's another. Um, the receptionist at the financial services firm where the victim worked was an African-American woman. <laughs> she could have talked to somebody real quick. She has the conversation with the victim about the weekend and the kids and whatever else. That could have been also with someone else, too. I don't know. What yeah. are you doing this weekend? Well, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, like... That'd be nice. It'd be nice. to. to yeah. <laughs> um, no, we, we have, a, I think, a double flunk on, uh, on this, unfortunately. I... Yeah, it's too bad. That's rough. <laughs> All right, uh, best. It's hard to do best juror moment when the, really the whole movie is about uh, the jury. Um, I, I, I so and we talked about the jury a lot, obviously because of that. So uh, I just had I, I do like the scene where um, Marley and Easter decide to kick a juror be, to punish uh, Fitch, and they uh, use that whiskey lady mm. uh, to uh, the the juror that has the drinking problem, mm. um, and. Uh, <laughs> and get the whiskey bottle onto the floor where the bailiff sees it and yeah. uh and and get I, I like that part um actually there's a really good line there he comes in and acts like he's hung over and yeah. she says rough night and he says i woke up on my stove <laughs> <laughs> uh, i uh, love that line that was good i yeah. love that line and then they go into the judge's chambers and he kind of acts like it was him, but oh, then yeah. it's pretty yeah. easy for I'm the Spartacus. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, I guess good thing for him that like the, the lipstick was on the bottle because otherwise. Yeah. I don't judge- know. I, I don't, I think the judge knew it was her the whole time anyway, but, mm. um, and the judge even said, uh, uh, yeah, there was a line about, uh, Oh, uh, Easter says, um, judge, I, I gave my oath or it gave my word to give my level best. And I meant it <laughs> my level best <laughs> <Yeah>. says level <laughs> best, level best. And then, uh, the judge is well, as difficult as it that is to believe. I think it's even more difficult to believe that this is your whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I love all that. Um, your particular shade of, of particular lipstick. shade of lipstick on the bottle there. Um, do you have any other juror moments? Um, yeah, I'm going to go with uh, when Grimes walks into the courtroom and the judge says, uh, Mr. Grimes, we've excused you from service. You don't have to be here or something like that. And and he's basically like, what? Like, are you trying to keep me from serving? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. and lays lays out the law. I, yeah. I think that's that's my hero moment. It's great. It really I is. want to serve. I love that. Yeah. Uh, best client moment. Mm. So our clients are the CEO, I guess, slash his little cabal <laughs> um, <laughs> of other CEOs. And then Celeste Wood. So, um, you know, we've talked about some of the uh, gun client uh, things earlier. I think for me on the plaintiff side, we don't get a lot with. Celeste would, but actually did think that, um, in kind of a, a, a in a real sense, like I, I appreciated the moment where she was feeling discouraged about mm-hmm. the, um, prospects mm-hmm. of the case moving forward. And she, you know, was basically questioning whether it was worth it and was asking Roar to tell her that it was worth it and that they mm-hmm. did still have a good case and a chance to win and all that. Mm-hmm. And he had to reassure her mm-hmm. of that. Um, yeah. I just thought that was a real, like, I thought that was a real moment. Like I can imagine mm-hmm. those moments are, are pretty prevalent in a mm-hmm. long drawn out, emotional, difficult 
case like that. Um, so th- for me, that was, that was my best kind of client moment. Yeah. That's the safe bet. That's probably <laughs> what I should have gone with, man. Well, I like I'm, to hear that there's an unsafe bet you're about yeah, to make. So let's I'm hear going it. with, you know, the, the guns manufacturer CEO on the witness stand, you know, or, or after he gets off the witness stand and you already mentioned this moment, he gets in the hallway, he's upset and you know, the, and then, uh, Fitch is, uh, telling him, well, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. We, we've, we're going to get this jury. Uh, we're going to purchase this verdict or whatever. And he's like, I was under the impression that we already purchased a verdict. You know? <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my moment. That's uh, his, his say, swagger. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause after he gets, uh, he gets flustered on the stand. Actually, he, he does criticize the lawyers for not having him better prepared for being on the stand. Mm-hmm. I thought that was interesting. That's true. Um, and then, uh, he's, Fitch tells him it's a game of cat and mouse and the CEO. That's says, right. Yeah. Uh, make sure a little more cat, a little less mouse. A little huh? less you mouse, know? yeah. <laughs> That's great. Fitch, I looked in the faces of those jurors. I didn't see any friends sitting there. Now, where the hell are we with securing my verdict? cat and mouse game. We're about to change yeah. on it. You just be a little more cat, a little less mouse. <laughs> that's it that's i'm changing my you change it to that uh, that's a pretty yes. good little line that he has <laughs> um yeah he's fired up um all right uh best scene um so you've already mentioned the jury having lunch with the judge i think is a really great scene <laughs> um after they set up the lunch to be delayed and they don't have any lunch so that they can kind of show off that uh, they've got the jury, uh, uh, and can move the jury if they want to actually, we didn't talk about this part of it, but, uh, I liked how, uh, roar and, uh, the jury consultant see them in there and, uh, and roars line something like, uh, in 35 years, that's the most outrageous thing I've ever seen or something like that. Watching the jury eat lunch with the judge. Yeah. And, and we haven't said this either. Like, I mean, the the movie made it out to where it was like there weren't incentives on either side for a mistrial. But honestly, how many times throughout this thing would there have been a mistrial? Yeah. And I mean, that's a great point. I had a note to talk about. I mean, there is this really delicate balance when you're in a trial and you've invested so much time and so much effort and, and money resources into picking the right jury getting your evidence together, you know, presumably having some aspect of the element of surprise at work when you're, you know, throwing things on the other side in the courtroom for the first time. And you really have to balance when you want to ask for a mistrial and when you don't. Yeah. Right. Because if you get, if you get, I mean, if, if you're a lawyer, you want a diverse jury <clears throat> and they're not, uh, necessarily that common. You've got six uh, minorities on your jury. You've got six uh, white people on your jury. Um, you feel like you've got the jury with you, and then then some crazy stuff happens, and then you've got to decide whether or not you want to protect your your purely legal interests in preserving the 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 sanctity of the legal aspects of the trial or do you want to preserve the the humanity of your jury the 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 makeup of your jury and the chemistry that you have with them and roll the dice and keep going forward that's a really hard decision to make yeah yeah you know and and especially like if you if you like your jury but you're not really sure how they're they're receiving the evidence you can't really read them or you know, like that, that's, man, that is tricky. Cause if you get what you want, I remember one lawyer telling me he was, he was asking for a mistrial. He didn't really want it, but he had to preserve his objections for appeal. Right. And so he had asked like three or four times and they were, they're pretty meritorious. And on the last time the judge says, if you ask me for a mistrial again, I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and so like right. what do you do, you know? Right. Hey. <sighs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that cuz I was actually going to ask you about that strategy of when you're asking for a mistrial only to preserve error, not really wanting it to be granted, right? right. That makes total sense um and, and a tough decision to make. Um so uh 
and, and we've we've talked about uh I, I do like that opening jury selection sequence, just sort of the one after the other, kind of watching them and analyze each juror and then either challenging them or not challenging them. We haven't uh oh, I'm saving it. Okay, I'm going to save that. Uh, I was about to. I thought I forgot something, it's, but it's in the I next if line. It's the same thing that I'm thinking about. <laughs> so we're good there. Um, and then also um, the the end sequence, the back and forth between the jury deliberation happening simultaneously with Doyle out solving the case, basically in in mm. Gardner. I, I mean, I like that scene. I I mean the bathroom scene, you know, for me especially, and also just being such fan especially of, of hackman but hoffman too and and knowing kind of the their friendship and not having worked together watching them in that scene in the bathroom kind of go at one another and and uh it's it was just i don't know i i love it and and just watching like the idealistic sort of atticus finchy type of uh you know lawyer in roar who really wants to do things the right way and, and all of that and then Fitch on the other side of it, just, you know, um, not buying into anything he's saying. And in fact, coming at it from the complete opposite perspective. And, um, I, I just, I just thought it was a, a really, really good scene. I mean, don't tell me you hung your case on somebody's conscience. I hung my case on my own conscience. Oh, I get it now. You are a moral man living in a world of moral relativity. It's just so quaint, so precious. Hey! Don't do that. This is about my witness, right? This is about you messing with my client, my case, and the rules of law that govern our country. And our country? Yes! I didn't figure you for a patriot, Mr. Rohr. What, with your blatant disregard for the people's right to bear arms? You know, the Second Amendment? Is that why you're doing this? Protect the Constitution? Is that Of course not. I'm in it to win, uh -huh. just like you are. Yeah. Because that's what I was hired to do. Uh -huh. Everything else is colored bubbles. Colored bubbles? Colored bubbles? A system that calls for 12 people to sit and listen to testimony of witnesses, fella. And that includes my witness, who you've disappeared. If you're relying on testimony to win this case, you've already lost it, fella. And, and uh, you know, it, it's not even one that um, is necessary for the movie, not really. It's just mm. more there, I think, to let them do that. Right. And uh, and bring that kind of star power to to a scene like that. And um, But I, I'm glad they did it because it... I mean, yeah, I thought it was great. So those are a yes. few other than what we've already talked about. Yes. And <laughs> yes, here's, here, here's the thing. That whole exchange, which was great. You're, you're absolutely right. It's the back and forth. They're, they're playing tennis. Um, just oh, two pros. The lines, the individual lines. Are, yeah. Yeah. They're in a bathroom. And yeah, I, no, I know. I'm sorry. I got, I, I, I don't. Just, yeah, anytime you, you have know, to say the bathroom scene, yeah. that's probably not a good way to lead into a great scene. Public service announcement. I, I'm just full disclosure. Like, don't talk to me in the bathroom. Uh, I don't care who you are. I, I don't care if it's the president. Like, I, I, when I'm in the bathroom, I become an introvert. I just fair disclosure. I'm an eight. I am a. I am an outspoken eight. I am an extrovert all the way. When I'm in the bathroom, I am a French mime uh, and I don't want uh, you talking to me. I don't look at me. Don't look over my way. Don't you, you go in, you, you keep your eyes straight ahead. You take care of your business. You wash your hands and you, and you walk out and you don't, we don't even make eye contact in the bathroom. Yeah. I don't, don't try to have small talk with me in the, in the convert in the bathroom, especially not like a debate about, a, you know, larger, yeah, idealistic. No, no, we're in the bathroom, dude. Just go away. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. It can wait. Entirely fair. <laughs> <laughs> entirely fair perspective and entirely fair critique of the scene. I agree. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. completely unrealistic for that reason. <laughs> Absolutely. What do you have other scenes? Um, you know. My my favorite scene, I, I've already alluded to it earlier, is when the jurors are kind of going back and forth and they're talking about whether they should take a uh, initial vote just yeah. to see where everyone yeah. is. And uh, uh, Easter, you know, teases out how Herrera really feels about the situation and and gets everyone to come at the the evidence just with a, a level headed approach and. Um, and to try to, to really give an honest view of the evidence rather than allowing their, their feelings to rule the day. That's, that's my favorite. You know, I, 
I did forget there there are two uh potential uh best judge moment and best juror moments that I forgot to to oh. mention. Yeah, go back, do that. Be- best judge the pronunciation of voir dire. <laughs> <laughs> Because for those that are not among the initiated, there is a huge East Coast, West Coast rap battle thing going on here between Texas and every other state of the union. <laughs> when it say. comes to the pronunciation of yeah. of that word, it's in Texas, it's voir dire. The, the actual word is, is voir dire. But it, it's, it's really funny to watch a movie where they... they pronounce it correctly and it's yeah. it's what yeah. <laughs> um so that was and then the uh my favorite juror moment i'm gonna i'm gonna amend it's the protester that that gets stricken for cause or gets preemptory stricken and he stands up and opens up his shirt and and, he's, and it's like, you know, guns are murder or something like that. And then this is the blood of innocent lives and throws it on his shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I want to be heard. That's the best. Yeah. Yeah. So I had, you know, I, we have, we've only done it a couple of times, but we had added a uh, contempt of court award or the flesh <laughs> read award, which I had sort of loosely defined as a criticism of anything in the movie. But when I've, when I was looking at my outline and I saw contempt of court, Fletcher Reed, I thought that crazy juror was perfect for the Fletcher Reed award. Um, and cause he got tossed out. Basically he didn't get arrested. I don't think thrown into jail for contempt, but uh, yeah, no, that's a great one. Absolutely. Good, good, good. Um, we've said a lot of, uh, of good quotes already. Um, and uh, I'm trying to look through here to see if we've left any out. I mean, I, I think the line of the movie is we've already said, gentlemen, trials are too important to be left up to juries. Yeah. And then they all laugh. And it's hard to, to beat that quote. Oh, we've said the defense thesis of the case. <laughs> yeah. I was already on the impression we already purchased ourselves a verdict. That's it. I, good you one. know, I do, I do have, I, I think a line better than that is the cool. exchange. Um, goodness, forgive me in the bathroom where uh, roar says to Finch, nice shoes, big tobacco, big alligator. I wrestled it myself. <laughs> oh, Nice suit. Very um, of the people. Yours is nice. What would you call it? Gun lobby protecting its own. Oh, swank shoes. Big tobacco, big alligator. Wrestled it myself. All right. Yeah, no, that there are so many, like there's too many lines back and forth in that to, to count. I mean, um, because, you know, if you're relying on testimony to win this case, you've already lost it fella. Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, and then, uh, roars is these are people Fitch. And Fitch says my point. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) They're just, they're on such completely different wavelengths yeah there's just there's no common there's no, there's no commonality there at all yeah none. yeah um and uh there was something else and i i looked it up and i don't know maybe you know what this means and maybe i'm just a, uh, you know uh I, I don't know uh but uh every fitch says in the in that same scene fitch says uh something and then and everything else is just colored bubbles yeah. What what's colored bubbles about? Yeah, I don't know, but like he like Rora was really upset about it too. Like colored color bubbles. bubbles. Color yeah. bubbles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that's about. Oh, and I no. just pulled it up to see if it would come up quickly, like in some like, you know, urban dictionary or like uh <laughs> what's this thing or you know, like what's right, this is that is that like a racial or... slur or like what is uh, Yeah, it? like honestly, like I don't know. <laughs> so I apologize if it is I really like I don't know what it is, but um I, I looked it up real quick to make sure like I didn't think it was something like crazy, but um, I just don't know what it is. So yeah, if anyone well, knows what that means, let us know. Yeah. Holler. And obviously <laughs> in context, in context, it just means like nonsense or irrelevant. Right. Like yeah. I suppose from the way that he used it, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, when Easter and Fitch are talking uh, that one night, um, and Easter says, is there any such thing as an objective jury, Mr. Fitch? And he, Fitch says, well, not if I can help it. 
<laughs> I love it. A man uh, loves his job. He does. That's for sure. Um, Roar on the phone with Marley when he's turning her down on the ten million says, "You know, it's amazing how easy it is to procure ten million dollars." Yeah, it's an interesting exercise. <laughs> Yeah, it's like that he's gone through that, and he obviously convinced his partners to let him yeah. have it. Yeah, right. That's what's yeah. that's implying. Yeah, he got it. And and what like what is what what were they going to do there? Like so, like if both sides pay, then they the thought is just like okay, so they just use all that all money, money for the victims. Know. But like you're you're taking it away from one victim in order. Yeah, to, like what? Or I mean, yeah, I don't know what. That's a good point. Like, what would have been the plan had it been? the plaintiffs that paid either half or all of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What well, were they have given it back to them or given it to Celeste Wood or, um, that, I guess that was sort of the way I thought about it. Um, mm. or that they, that they would have not actually taken his money. Um, but I don't know. It's a good question. Mm. You uh, know, all right. <clears throat> let me add inadmissible evidence. Well, before we, let me add one more oh, I'm sorry. moment. The the moment on the stand, the CEO is on the stand. He's being cross examined, and he and he's asked about why would you advertise a gun that has print a print resistant finish? Also available in a print resistant finish. I see. Now, who in your mind, sir, might be eager to purchase a Performer 990 semi-automatic assault type weapon in a fingerprint resistant finish? Anybody? Anybody? Fingerprints are ninety percent water. Water corrodes metal, metal rust. Yes. And his answer is, well, prints are 90% water. Water corrodes. Corrosion causes rust. <laughs> that was such a great answer. <laughs> and then Roar's like, well, couldn't you just said rust proof? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you dirty dog. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Okay. Prints okay. cause water. Water. Rust. Rust. <laughs> That's so good. I love that. Oh, um... Oh, earlier, those CEOs in that uh, first meeting with Fitch say, I would have thought, you know, $20 million could buy us a verdict in the People's Republic of Berkeley, California, let alone here. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Oh, did you have something else? Did you have, there was there another moment before Mm -hmm. we did Mm -hmm. inadmissible Mm -hmm. evidence? Nope. Okay. No, no. Um, I just have a couple things here. Um. I should have picked up on this and I'm mad that I didn't until I read it um, afterwards. So in the jury pool, the alternate who gets onto the jury um, after they kick the one lady for the whiskey thing, Mm -hmm. um, she's got kind of the goth look going on and her name is Lydia Dietz. Yes. Which if that name rings a bell for people that are movie people, that is the same name as the gothic character played by Winona Ryder in Beetlejuice. Get out of Lydia here. Dietz. Well, I read through that handbook for the recently deceased. It says, live people ignore the strange and unusual. I myself am strange and unusual. Oh, and I love Beetlejuice. Man. And I don't know how I missed it. I feel like a total failure as a Beetlejuice fan. <laughs> Think about that. That's so cool. Okay, so Beetlejuice was 1988. Yeah, um, and Winona Ryder played the girl, the, like the teenager, gothic kind of teenager. Yeah. Her name was Lydia, and their last name was Dietz. Wow. And that was the name of the juror, and they had her in that same kind of look. It's totally yeah. intentional. It's great. Yeah. Love that. That's crazy. I just I don't see any commonalities in the writers or the directors or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, that I don't know. Wow. So that's really that's cool. I'm a fan of that. Yeah. <laughs> so in 1997, so remember this movie's 2003. In 1997, this movie was originally set to go. Listen to this now. This is a totally different movie. With Edward Norton as Nick Easter. Ooh. Joel Schumacher directing. And uh, Sean Connery as Fitch. And Gwyneth Paltrow as Marley. Wow. So there's that movie. That um, would have been good. Schumacher had to drop out for something. It delayed it. Then the other actors kind of moved on. Um, and then actually Will Smith was in talks to play Nick Easter uh, with Jennifer Conley as Marley. 
Um, and then it again got dropped installed. And so anyway, a, a real interesting dynamic there. And actually, and in the meantime, it's when that inside man uh, came out. So all along then it was going to be still the tobacco companies and the delay is what got them on the other side of that inside insider. I'm sorry, not inside man insider movie. And then they changed it to the gun uh, company defense thing. Um, so yeah, this movie could have been a lot of different things as opposed to what it wound up. How do you feel about the original, the originally planned cast though? Edward Norton, Sean Connery, Gwyneth Paltrow. That that's man, I think that that has a whole different intensity. <laughs> like I, I think it like it goes up like two or three notches at that point. Gwyneth Paltrow, I mean, uh, those are all home run hitters in my opinion. Um, so I think, yeah, like and and I thought Rachel Wise did a good job in this, but obviously at the time, I mean, Gwyneth Paltrow is just uh, elevates that character because of just her star power at that point. Mm-hmm. It's just a, the characters at a different level. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Cusack is he, he's almost always in comedies. Yep. And this role was more serious than I think anything he'd done up to that point. Right. But his likability, you know, and his his sort of um, just his lovability as a, a goofy character. It brought a credibility to that character. And then to kind of like to see the twist, I, I think it did something different, but, but Ed Norton, I mean, that, that, that would have been, I mean, he could definitely have pulled that off. You know? Oh, if you rolled, if you like rolled the trailer of that out with Edward Norton as Easter, Sean Connery as Fitch and Paltrow as Marley. I mean, I would have been going to see it um, in the theater, just like I did the way it came out. Yeah, um, for sure. Like, I, I I don't know if it would have been better or worse, but I would have gone to see it. I, yeah. I have no doubt. I think that's um, a better casting. I don't know how they would have played with Dustin Hoffman. Like that, that would have that's true. Really... That didn't. Uh, yeah, that note that I have doesn't say anything about. It. So presumably that's still with Dustin Hoffman. I don't know if that's true or not, but that would have been interesting um, and different for sure. Well, I think it also would have to have Sean Connery opposite Dustin Hoffman. I, that really would have, I think, intensified the sort of David versus Goliath hmm. dynamic there between those two characters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So much gravitas. Do you find anything else like uh, tidbits or anything? Not a lot. Um, I was going to ask you um, kind of in in the same vein. um I I don't know about you. I'm a huge, huge eighties fan, huge, uh, John Cusack fan. So yeah, I, I want you to, to name, and there's a right answer here. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, three movies that John Cusack was in among, among these three movies, better off dead. Yes. Gross point blank. I love that movie. And say anything. Which you got two of them have to go. Only one can stay. Which one is it? Which is which? Which is the survivor? Oh, the so best? I'm sorry. So you're so he's in all three, and you're he's asking um, if I have to like basically pick two of the three. No, you got to pick one. I pick one of the three as like yeah. just my favorite Cusack. Yeah, well, that and like let's say that the, the Thanos snaps his his hand right, his finger, and then two of these movies go away and they're never made. Ah. So one survives. One of these movies survives. And it was uh, Say Anything, Better Off Dead, and Gross Point Blank. Yes. So <laughs> I don't know. No, no disclaimers here. <laughs> There's no disclaimer here. I don't think I'm giving you the probably the right answer here. But I will tell you, the movie that I enjoy the most in terms of like, and watch it mold, like I'll watch it if it comes on or I would watch it over. And I think I would want it to live on and I could still watch it more is gross point blank. Yeah. Yeah. That's my, that's my pick. Yeah. 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 I agree. Really? I, I, you know, I, I actually, I was, you said there was a right choice. So I want to know what you thought going in. The problem is I think that you made the right choice. I I think going into it, I thought better off dead. Oh, that one's just so good. 
it is but know, i don't find it to be one that like and... i don't find it to be one that like i would go back and so like i i mean so here's my little test for that i uh back when i actually had like a library of dvds you know when we did that whenever that was <laughs> back in the day <laughs> <laughs> we don't really have those anymore. This, the same arrow when you had the the, the CD case the, under the, your visor that and that like down. Blu-ray competitor DVD <laughs> player that didn't make it a year. Yeah, uh, I owned Gross Point Blank. I did not own the other two. Better. Off. And so while I had seen them all and I liked them all, Gross Point Blank for whatever reason was just one that I was drawn to. Which, by the way, Jeremy Piven is a uh, is the friend in that. Um, uh, and who's in this movie and Joan Cusack, who you mentioned is great and mini driver and everybody, if you haven't seen gross point blank, you should definitely see it. It's great. Dan Aykroyd's fantastic. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that's the one I would pick. Yeah. It's a good question. Good question. I like that. Yeah. Um, cause he's got, and he's got so many John Cusack. He's got so many. Yeah. Like, um, let's wrap it up. We're almost to two hours. The movie's 207, so we can't go over that. <laughs> uh, what do you think about this thing? How does it hold yeah. up? I, I think I think your original question actually is the one that I come back to for the kind of talking about the closing of this. Mm-hmm. The fact that they made the switch from the novel to the movie going from tobacco to guns makes this thing still very relevant, mm-hmm. still very important. I mean... No joke. I was looking this up before the Sandy Hook families who were suing Remington uh, and had a couple of favorable court rulings to be able to keep that case alive from the Connecticut Supreme Court. And then the United States Supreme Court decided not to review it. And so basically stood by the the at least, you know, uh, without opinion, but uh, the Connecticut Supreme Court um, just last this past August, actually, there was an article about it uh, because Remington is tr- is filing for bankruptcy. Oh, wow. And so there's a big question about not just the Sandy Hook victims, families and their lawsuits, but I'm, I imagine a number of other lawsuits against Remington and what's going to happen as this thing plays out in bankruptcy court and what will it be allowed to survive and... You know, did that ba- are, and are they doing it for the purpose of sort of avoiding a lot of the liability from those lawsuits? Um, but anyway, so so it's still, th- I mean, the, the the context of of the uh, the gun piece, but also just the mm-hmm. you know the civic duty of being a juror and the mm-hmm. viability of jury trials. I mean, as we're going through this pandemic, not having juries. I mean, I just think it's all mm-hmm. still very relevant. Yep. I, so I think it holds up in 2020 very, very well. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know that it'll, it'll ever stop yeah. being relevant, you yeah. know? And, and that's not, that's not saying that's not making any shade or, or, or throwing any shade towards. Yeah, I hear you. You know, like it, it's just our nation is in a unique um, conundrum when it comes to how to interpret the second amendment and how do we, regulate guns and should we and to how, to what extent and i just think that 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 debate's going to be with us for a very long time and so this is always going to be relevant yeah yep i think that's right um all right so i did give this some thought <clears throat> ahead of time okay on what my gavel rating was going to be mm-hmm. uh and um you know, I think where I landed was, I don't think I, up until now, right now, I don't think I'd given a score that I had already given before. So every, up until now, we've done six or seven of these and every one of them I've slotted in somewhere. Mm-hmm. I think this is going to be the first one that I put a same score as another movie on. Mm. Um, and that's bound to happen at some point, obviously. Um, but it's happening now. <laughs> uh, so I landed on, um, uh, an 87 for me, mm. which puts it, I think I don't have it right in front of me, but with, um, I gave legally blonde the same yep. score. Yep. And like one point behind witness for the prosecution, I think I had given an 88. Um, so it's sort of, for me, I have a cluster now of movies in this 87 to 88 range of those three, this one, a runaway jury and, uh, 
uh, legally blonde and um, witness for the prosecution that are kind of in the middle, that kind of a cluster now that's, that's like the middle cluster with the uh, high end cluster being Hamilton and uh, my cousin Vinny and a few good men. And then the lower cluster being some of the others that we've done. So that's kind of where I wound up coming down on, on this movie. Yeah. I've kind of snookered myself in a, in a similar way. <laughs> this, this is what I get for starting off hard. I with, guess you can uh, start giving like decimal point ratings. I was wondering, you know, you can, cause that's where I am. If I can, I tell you, or you, or your I, scale, we, we may need to extend your scale to one fifty or what 200 or something. I think someone needed to explain to me, um, you know, the value of, uh, going, uh, pacing myself, and and that the numbers don't have to start at 90 and then go to 100. That would have been helpful. Right. Um, for reference, I did 90 on Witness for the Prosecution. I did an 89 on Legally Blonde. I did an 88 on Liar Liar. Um, I feel like this is I, – I enjoy this better than Legally Blonde. I feel like it's more relevant. Um, I I still – favor witness for the prosecution over it yeah so i'm gonna split the hair <laughs> yeah <laughs> you get see what i there i, I, I saw it at 89.5 89.5 so we're per, i think based on how we've been doing these i think we have a very similar view on this movie it sounds like because uh, we slotted him in about the same place relative to the other movies that we've reviewed yeah. um and so, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, that's cool. Um, it's a good movie. If you haven't seen it, uh, or it's been a long time, like we've said, it's it's kind of held up and it's still relevant uh, for sure. So go back, check it out. Runaway Jury. Uh, it's a good one. And like I said, it'll probably be the first of a number of John Grisham uh, movies slash or books slash movies that we'll do. Um, and excited to get the first one. Uh, done. Which, by the way, we didn't give enough probably uh, due to John Grisham. Uh, we'll do that at a different time. We'll do, we'll have more for him. I've got stuff on him too that I'd like to talk about. Um, but uh, he will be a fixture at, at, on the next probably round of movies that we do. So, yeah, yeah. Can I give a closing argument? You may. Let's do it. So, may it please the court. One of the themes in this movie that I think comes up a lot is the importance of jury service, as you've alluded to earlier, and our civic duty. And I've heard it said by lawyers, and I think it's true, that in some way, our duty as citizens to be committed to being neutral and uh, impartial jurors and serving on a jury is in a lot of ways even more important than our exercise of our right to vote. Hear me out. This is what I mean by that. We vote for a president and that gets diluted by electors who go to the electoral electoral college. And then when you, let's say your candidate wins, um, they may or may not do some of the things that you're wanting them to do, but chances are they don't see eye to eye with you 100% on all the things that are relevant to you. Same thing's true with our congressmen. Um, I mean, at least there's not the electoral college issue, and and that's true. It's not uh, present with our Senate. But those people represent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who all have diverse views, and they have to sort of balance that all out when they go to D.C. or when they go to our nation's capital or our state capitals. But on jury service, when you vote, your vote has a one-to-one direct impact correlation uh, to what's going on in front of you. And oftentimes, in, in the context of a criminal jury, where someone's life liberty is at issue, you're making a direct impact and a direct difference with your vote on that person's life. And so... I would submit that in terms of the power that Americans wield, um, that there is no other place in which we have more power with a vote than in the courtroom when we're serving on the jury. And so while it is often a pain for a lot of people and it's an inconvenience to serve on a jury, it's of infinite importance to the parties, but then to the system as a whole, 
because that's the best way to make sure that we have representation. Well said. Well said. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. We appreciate you listening and thanks for being here. Be sure to check out our other movie podcasts uh, that are in the feed. If you haven't had a chance to listen to those yet, uh, we're starting to rack up a little library of them now. Uh, so go back, check those out and stay tuned for the next one, whenever that is. Also, don't uh, forget to, to check out uh, our uh, Monday mentor episodes each Monday. And uh, with that, thanks again, Robert Callahan. So bye. Fun, yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. Take care, everybody. Yeah.